All right. We're going into the book of Acts, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 8, if you're a note taker. And I'm going to pray over this just briefly. Lord Jesus, as we open your word, we need you. We need you to keep us from false teaching. We need you to keep us from bad conclusions, Lord. We, we need you to help us to see the real one true God and all your glory, God, in your word. So, God, I pray that with these words on the page, we would also have your Holy Spirit right next to us telling us what's real. And, God, I know even across this room, we didn't all come in with the same kind of needs and so, God, I, I just pray, Lord, that you would go, go across all this place, God, even the folks that are watching online right now, and that, Lord, you would be ministering to each heart, Lord, the breakthrough, Lord, the healing, the encouragement, God, the joy, all the things, God, that, that are needed across this place. God, I just entrust your people to you. Amen. Come and minister. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Acts chapter 8, verse 26. So we've been finishing up the part two of Acts. We're going to do part three probably next January and finish up the book. Uh, we've been doing um, also the <laughs> leftovers of part two. And um, it's just been some amazing additional passages that we've been able to preach through. And today is primarily it's about baptism. So if you've had questions before about baptism, um, even some of the controversies that might surround baptism, today is for you. So chapter 8, verse 26. Here we go. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So let me give you just a little bit of context here. Philip is an evangelist in the early church. He was one of the kind of deacon-like figures that was selected by the early church. And he is a wonderful preacher. He started to go into all the world, specifically into Samaria. Um, he's taking the gospel out. And after he's gone and preached in Samaria, he gets this word from the, from, from the angel saying, go down this specific desert road. And the road he's been sent down is an odd road because it's more of an abandoned road is what we know about it. It is desert. It's, it's not the kind of place where you're going to expect to see a lot of people, but that's where the angel told him to go. So he started out. And he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, verse 27, a eunuch of great authority under the Kondaken. Um, her name is Candace, or her title is Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And the eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. So I need to keep introducing the characters to you. Who's this guy? Uh, he is part of the royal palace. He's part of, uh, he's one of the royal officials from Ethiopia. He's about a thousand miles away. He's traveled up here to Jerusalem. Uh, now, Kondike or, or, or Kondiken, uh, Candace, that is not the name of the queen of Ethiopia. It is a title. So think in terms of like ancient Rome and, and the Caesars. It was, it was each one that came in succession. Uh, the emperors were called Caesars. This is the title of the queen of Ethiopia was Candace. And, and so he worked with her. It says he was a eunuch. Some of you know what that means. So I'll just be brutal about it to make sure we're all on the same page here. But he was a castrated male. Why would you do that? Because when you were in the royal palace and you were the king, you didn't want any funny business happening with your wife. And they were brutal in those days. And so they would take slaves or they would take officials, trusted servants, and they would turn them into eunuchs so that they could trust that everything was on the up and up. Are we all caught up there? Okay. Okay. Um, he had great authority, though. So he wasn't just any servant. He had been given great authority. He had been made the treasurer of the palace. And so when he came up, he comes up with a whole entourage is the way that you've got to see that. That carriage, think like a stagecoach, but, stage but beautiful and luxurious. And, and he's got an entourage of servants in front and behind, both as protectors and people who are serving him because he's an important guy. He's wealthy. He has power. He's popular in his home country. He's highly trusted. How, do you, how many of you do know that the treasurer is very trusted? The treasurer is very trusted. Now, he traveled up to Jerusalem 
because he's a worshiper of Yahweh. He's from a foreign country. He's a Gentile. But he's come up here because he's a worshiper of Yahweh. And he's on his way back. He's on his way back from that worship experience. And he's reading from Isaiah. Verse 29, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. I, I underlined there, Philip ran over because the, the, the Holy Spirit had just said, go walk over there. And he runs. This is a guy who is passionate. Amen. This is a guy who is not wishy-washy. He's not hemming and hawing. Are you, are you sure that you said that, God? He runs right over to the chariot. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading out of the prophet Isaiah? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up to the carriage and sit with him in the carriage. We're going to have a Bible study up here. We're going to talk through this passage, the prophet Isaiah. I love what the eunuch does here. He's reading the Bible. So he's got the scroll of Isaiah. Now, one thing that you need to know is people didn't have scrolls in those days. There was no printing press. Books were not cheap. If you had a scroll of one of the books of the Old Testament, it had been hand copied, hand written, and they were extremely expensive. So this guy had used his resources to get himself his own copy of the Old Testament, not just going to go to synagogue and have access to it there, probably because he was a foreigner and he needed his own access. But I just love and respect that this guy's willing to go to great lengths to seek and know God. Isn't it weird that sometimes we have, I don't say sometimes, we have the greatest access to scripture in human history right now. Yeah. It's so available. It's available in all these translations. It's available electronically. It's available to be read to us. And sometimes we struggle to find the time to read God's living word in our lives. I'm not trying to beat up on us. I'm just trying to show you this guy and say, he's pretty cool, amen? Because <laughs> he's going after it. And he's reading it and he's got nobody to explain it to him. So he takes the ne next step that shows the work of God in his life. Not only is he reading it, but when he's got questions, he asks for help. Some of us also struggle to ask for directions. Anybody in here ever get lost in their car before and refuse to ask directions? couple elbows going like that. I know. It's a beautiful picture. He's willing to say, I need somebody to sit with me with my Bible open and walk me through this. That's discipleship, guys. That's relationship. This is the journey of the Ethiopian. Okay, Acts chapter 8, 32. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. Now, this is amazing. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Who's this talking about? Jesus. Good job. This is Jesus. This is Isaiah chapter 53. He was humiliated and he received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. Now, if your, your Bible has cross references in it, it's gonna say Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the fourth of the servant songs in the book of Isaiah. The servant songs are prophecies, very special prophecies in the Old Testament about the suffering servant. The fact that the Messiah was not just going to be a powerful military figure, but that he was going to suffer for the people of God. And it was a unique perspective on the Messiah, but Isaiah had said it and he had described it in great detail. He described so much detail about how Jesus was gonna suffer and die for the sins of people that many scholars consider Isaiah 53 the fifth gospel because we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But for these people at that time, those books weren't in circulation yet. They would have had Isaiah. They would have had specifically Isaiah 53. And if you are a note taker, I'll just say, go back and look at the walk to the road to Emmaus when Jesus resurrected and he was there with his two disciples. And it says that he sat down and he showed them from the Old Testament exactly why the Christ was to die and rise again he probably went to Isaiah 53. Amen. So what does it say? He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. Isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit directed the Ethiopian to this exact passage right when Philip walked up? Yeah, yeah. Coincidence, probably. Uh -oh. 
John the Baptist had called Jesus the Lamb of God. So it's talking about the Lamb of God. This is Jesus, and Philip knows it. He's explaining it because Jesus was the Passover sacrificial lamb for us. It says that he was silent before his accusers, just like a lamb would be. And Jesus was silent during his uh, trial before the people that mocked and tortured him. Jesus was silent. He did not answer their accusations. Jesus was humiliated. It says that no justice was received by Jesus because he was accused by Pilate, yet he was not actually guilty of what he was accused of. Do you remember when Pilate washed his hands of Jesus and said, I don't actually believe this guy's guilty. And I'll have no part in this, even though you did actually have a part in this pilot, but he received no justice. And then he had no physical descendants who can speak of his descendants because he never married Jesus and, and, and he never had children because he died young. Acts 8, 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And man, what an opening for Philip to step into. And so beginning with that same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. I would give a lot of money to have been sitting there in that chariot with those two people yeah. and just listening to that conversation. Oh, yeah. Verse 36, they rode along and they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? I love that. First off, look, there's some water. Why is there an exclamation mark there? Because we're in the desert. And look, there's water. That's odd. Just like everything up to this point has been odd and a coincidence. Here comes another coincidence. Maybe God, maybe. Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And so he ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and, and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Oh, there's a lot jammed into that. I love that he says, why can't I be baptized? Why can't I be baptized? Is there anything in the way, Philip? Obviously, he had listened to enough of the gospel. Philip was satisfied that he had given his life to Jesus Christ. The belief had happened. The surrender had happened. The, the new birth had happened within him. And sure, we'll go baptize you. I love that. Um, I love that the entourage had to stop. What are we doing? We're doing a baptism. So all of this guy's servants that know him and know what a big wig this guy is, and they're all gonna travel back to Ethiopia with him telling the story of what happened, they all get to stand and watch the Ethiopian official get baptized right there. This is a public baptism that is a sign and a symbol, and it's a gospel preached to all the people that are around you. That's what baptism is supposed to be. So the carriage stopped, and they go down into the water. You immersion people, there you go. And there, it's right there. I'll leave it alone. Um, and then, then in the end of it, then in the end of it, the Holy Spirit snatches Philip away. Did you see that? If you keep reading through the rest of the book of, uh, or that, that chapter in Acts, you'll see that Philip pops up in another town and he doesn't skip a beat. He just starts preaching again. So this is the clearest evidence of teleportation superpowers that I've ever seen in scripture. You're welcome. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I also see indication that Jesus may have had teleportation superpowers and maybe we will too upon resurrection. So there you go. Don't quote me on that. I just think it's fun. Amen. Um, I, I just love that he disappears and pops up someplace else. Okay, Acts 8.36, in all seriousness. Acts 8.36, and that, this time I'm giving it to you in the ESV. Now, mostly what I do is I preach out of the New Living Translation because it's very modern, very easy to understand. But sometimes they're translating it so much they kind of miss some of the literal stuff. ESV is great for the literal so whenever I study, I, I try to study with multiple translations side by side. You Bible study students, that's what I do. So I'm giving you this in the ESV today just because I think some stuff got missed in the NLT. So in the ESV, here's what it says. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Because that's literally what he said. What's stopping me? What's preventing me? What's in my way, Philip, from getting 
baptized. And it's an odd way to say it, isn't it? You would almost imagine that like a modern preacher, Phillips would, would be saying, you should get baptized. Instead, it's the flip. He said, what prevents me from getting baptized? Um, it's curious. It got me digging a little bit. Why would he say prevent? Here's my guess as to why. I've got a picture of the temple here. So when it says that he traveled a thousand miles to go up and worship Yahweh in the temple, that's a picture, that's kind of a modern rendering of what the temple might have looked like. And notice De Deuteronomy 23.1. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. It's not every Sunday I get to say that word in church. <laughs> but it's in the Bible, so I had to. And again, you're welcome. Um, we don't do that every Sunday. <laughs> Deuteronomy 23.1, if you're a eunuch, you don't get to go into the temple. One of the many laws is part of the Old Testament law. And in that picture there, you can see that there's a, there's a wider temple court. It was called the court of the Gentiles. And, and people who wanted to worship Yahweh, they could kind of come into that area. Or maybe you were a tourist and you just wanted to see the temple, kind of walk around and see what was going on. Well, you could walk into that outer court. But I don't know if you can see that tiny little fence that's going all the way around the structure there. That inner structure, the inner courts. And that's where the, the bronze altar was and the table of showbread and, and the incense altar. All that stuff where you were really worshiping Yahweh. That was all inside of the main structure. But on the outside of the fence were the Gentiles and anybody else who was not allowed in. So he traveled a thousand miles, likely, and likely was unable to get inside. Likely, he was prevented from getting inside. It's a sad story. So when he's in his chariot and he looks over at Philip and says, what prevents me from having full access to God in my faith? And what prevents me to go down into the water and get baptized like every other Jew has gotten baptized who loves Jesus? And I could be somebody who loves Jesus. And I could be somebody who walks in every single way as a real Christian. What's to prevent me? Is there a fence here, Philip? No. No, there's not. And I love that. It's a sad story. Sometimes people are prevented from accessing God. Now, I'll just say briefly, I know I read an Old Testament verse. It was part of the Old Testament law that had been written in that law by God. But you've got to keep in mind, when Jesus came, he shattered all of that. Amen. When Jesus came and died on the cross, all the fences went down. And the only reason any Jew at that time would have stopped him from coming past, it's called a soreg, that fence was called soreg. Um, any, any, the only reason they would have stopped him is because they did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. They did not acknowledge that the whole world had changed because of what Jesus had done. There was a time I was talking to my dad and, and I was a kid and my grandfather never went to church, my grandpa True Blood. And I said, dad, why doesn't Papa go to church? And he said, there was a time when he started to date your grandpa, when Papa started to date your grandma. And his skin was so dark and his hair looked a certain way. He looked like he was Native, uh, Native American. And I've since done the DNA and none of us have any Native American in us at all. I'm white as white as white. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but he looked a certain way. So when he started to come to the church and there was prejudice at that time, they came to him and said, you're not welcome in this church. And that's all it took. And my dad's sitting there telling me the story and he's like, he's never set foot in a church again. And then my dad, who was far from God for most of his life that I knew him, had grown up in a home where the father of the house that he looked up to was not a man who went to church. And do you see the generational implications of such a decision? I'm not trying to put it all on those broken people who, who did that to him, but fences are a real thing. 
preventing people access to God is a real thing. Uh, even the disciples, when they were kids that wanted to come and be around Jesus, do you remember that? And they're like, no, 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 Jesus is too busy. No, 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 he's too important. We don't have time for kids. We got adults that we've got to serve. Jesus says, don't, don't hinder the children from coming to me for such is the kingdom of God. When people build fences. Jesus, he doesn't like that. Um, even when he went to the early church, uh, it's in the first chapter of Acts and he says, you're going to preach this gospel in Jerusalem and Judea, and then you're going to take it to, to Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. See, Philip was actually doing it because the Jews, they put up walls and Jesus had torn them down and said, now it's time for this to go to everybody, regardless of where they were born or what's been done to them. Amen. And Philip is doing it and there's historical uh, references. It's very interesting if you look into it, but there are churches in Ethiopia today that trace their lineage back to this exact eunuch. Um, they're worshiping Jesus today, and, and they say he's the one who came and started this church, specifically the Coptics, the Coptic Christians in Egypt trace their lineage back to this Ethiopian. It's it's an amazing thing. Not only was he saved, not only was he baptized, but he went and he planted churches and took it to others, to the ends of the earth. Now, I've said that Jesus does not make fences, and Jesus isn't about fences that prevent people from coming to him. But let me give this exception. Let me give this caveat because I, I need to be truthful. There are times that we ignore the commands of Jesus Christ. We think that if we can come to a God of grace, we get to make whatever choices and live whatever lifestyle that we want to live. And we forget that Jesus is Lord. We forget that God is King. And God actually makes demands on our lives. Jesus' followers are expected to follow Jesus. And that's real. And our choices do matter and our lifestyles do matter. And so... God is not a big grandpa fluffy in the sky who just winks at some of our choices and says, no big deal. He's the Lord of glory Amen. who has said, this is how I've called you to live. And so you can't separate him from his direction, from his wisdom, from his love that calls us to live, to calls us to follow Jesus on the path of Jesus. And so if there's a barrier, I would just say this. If there's a barrier between you and God, it is a barrier that you have made, yep. Yep. not that he has made. And you can unmake it if you come to him. The Ethiopian was not prevented. No one is preventing him anymore, and I love that. Um, the other thing I love about his statement, what's preventing me from being baptized, is that he's looking at baptism like it's a gift. Like it's something that he gets to be a part of, not something that somebody's telling him he ought to do. As a pastor, sometimes I feel like I'm, I, I'm kind of in that spot with people sometimes. Like, okay, you say that Jesus is your Lord, but you've not been baptized. How come? I think you should get baptized because the Bible talks about baptism as being something that's so quick right after you've accepted Jesus. Right after you're a new creation. You saw it in the passage today. What's to stop me from getting baptized? Like I'm going to do it now. And sometimes we look at baptism like this, like this ceremony that I might get to someday. And sometimes we wait months and sometimes we wait years and we're waiting for all the family can be there with the cameras and all the kind of stuff so that everything kind of comes together perfectly for this ceremony. But it's not what I see in scripture. People get saved and they get baptized and they see baptism not as a, as a to-do on their to-do list not something that Jesus is requiring of them, but he saw this as a gift that Jesus was giving to him. It's got a tweak in our minds, guys. Um, it's a gift. Colossians 2, 12, I'm gonna explain to you how it's a gift. Baptism unites us to Christ. Massive passage here. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, say with Christ, with Christ. You were buried with Christ. Just like Christ was, after he died on the cross, he was buried into the tomb. 
And that signified his death, right? In baptism, as you go down underneath the water, that is a symbol that you are being buried. It's a parable. It's a picture that you are being buried in death. Many of us grew up thinking that baptism was a picture of cleansing. And that actually was the baptism of John. It was a cleansing baptism from sin. It was a baptism of repentance. But the baptism of Jesus Christ is a baptism where you die. You die with him. And I know that's weird words, but what you're saying is my old life is dead. The life that I used to live for myself, I used to live it my way according to my agenda. That life is dead. Also, all the sins I've done, all the shame, all the things that I can't fix, I can't put it back together again. All of that is dead too. What amazing grace, yes? So that's dead. That all goes under the water. And then we just hold you there for a while. <laughs> jokes. These are jokes. Depends on how sinful you look to me. <laughs> just joking, joking. Go under the water, right back up, promise. <laughs> And with him, still in 12 here, and with him, say with him, with him, and with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God. That's belief. That trusted, that's belief. That's salvation. Like you reached out in faith toward Jesus. You trusted the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So, so your old life dies with him, and then you come back up as a resurrection with him resurrected with Jesus. And that kind of talk there is like, it, it's not only next to, it's, it's with him. It's, it, it's like a marriage between the two of you. It's a unifying of you and Jesus. Yeah. And that's a great mystery. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, with Christ again, for he forgave all your sins and he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Amen. God, how are we now with Christ? We were with Christ, we're with Christ. Like, how are we with Christ? Like, what does that mean? What kind of spiritual mystery are we actually talking about here? I don't know. Like what kind of interchange has happened because of baptism? How are we on a different footing post-baptism than we were before? There's a deep and powerful miracle that it's describing there that unifies my soul to God in a special way. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, baptism does not save you. Baptism is a parable, but when you read these verses carefully, it's not only a parable. It's not only a picture. There's more mystery going on to it than we know. Amen. Okay, this next section, I'm going to try and cl uh, clarify some of the um, big questions, even, even false teaching around baptism, because some of us grew up in churches that struggled with this or maybe taught you some things that made you fearful about baptism or your lack of baptism, and I want to clarify that. Um, so let's dive into this. This part's going to be a little bit teachy, but baptism doesn't save us, and I need to give you the verses that show you that. Baptism does not save us. The very first one says, God saved you by his grace when you believed you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. That's very important. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you've done. So none of us can boast about it. If you're understanding salvation correctly, it will not lead to pride and ego. It will only lead to humility and gratitude for what God has done for you. Um, now I say all this because there are passages in the New Testament where salvation and baptism were coupled together because they were so commonly hand in hand, especially there's some passages in the book of Acts where Peter is preaching and says, repent and be baptized. And all he's saying is these are the things that you need to do. He's not trying to say the baptism is part of the salvation picture though. You got to read scripture in scripture. You got to read scripture by scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. And so Ephesians comes back and says, this isn't what he meant. It's not your acts of righteousness, even baptism, 
that could lend itself to help your salvation take place. That would be your worth. That would be you earning. Not everything was done by Jesus. So Titus 3, 5, God saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. And he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. It's all done by God. Any righteous thing that you do in your life, if you can pull one off, it's done by God in you, right? It's God who, who wills, um, I don't remember the rest of it. Um, he's the one who helps us do righteous things. 1 Corinthians 1.14, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For God didn't send me to baptize, but to, tr- to preach the good news. That's a funny verse. So the apostle Paul is writing to a church in the city of Corinth and people were doing this really weird thing where they were saying, hey, if I got baptized, uh, water baptized by Paul, then I'm a fancier Christian than you are who was baptized by somebody else. And there was this comparison game that was going on. And so Paul is writing specifically about that and saying, it doesn't matter who baptized you. And then he goes even farther to really drive his point home. Says, I thank God I did not baptize you. If baptism is required for salvation, why would he ever say that? For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. Baptism is good. (laughs) Baptism is commanded by Jesus. Jesus himself was baptized. Baptism is important. We're going to talk more about how important it is. But it is not required for you to get to heaven. Don't miss that. And then finally, and I talked about this before, the thief on the cross. Remember when Jesus was on the cross and there was a thief on the cross next to him and the thief reached out to Jesus in his final moments and said, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said back to him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And nobody climbed a ladder and sprinkled that thief with water. It didn't happen. And so this unbaptized yet saved man entered glory on the same day that he died with Jesus. So don't don't miss that. Next thing I'll clarify for us is that belief comes first, then baptism. This is Acts 8, 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Both men and women. So you believe in Jesus first, You become a new creation. You get born again. You surrender your soul and your entire eternity to Jesus Christ. And the scripture says the old is gone. You're a new creation. The new has come. And when that moment happens, then you get water baptized. This is the reason we don't baptize infants at our church. I don't hate churches that do. I don't hate denominations that do. But we don't. Because we see this pattern in scripture, the belief in Jesus comes first and then water baptism. And and I I know that there's good hearts and and I've talked to those pastors and they've explained to me what their hearts are as far as why they baptize infants sometimes. I just think it's confusing. Don't feel like you're on uh, some kind of shaky ground with God if you've been baptized as an infant. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. We're all a former something. But here's the thing, pastorally, I've met a lot of adults who are really confused about when they got saved, who are really confused about when I got baptized as an infant, did that save me? Because if that saved me by being baptized as an infant, it's it's almost like my church's and my parents' faith kind of got joined to me, then I don't have to worry about finding Jesus and surrendering to Jesus when I become an adult. And that's wrong, guys. If you've never done that for yourself, the choice is still ahead of you. And I'm sorry that the other thing confused you, but that's why we don't baptize infants here. Next. A little bit of my story. When I was five years old, I got water baptized. I was in the Baptist church, great church. Um, They told me the gospel, led me through a sinner's prayer, had no idea really what I was praying. And I said the words, I got baptized, it was a great day, um, but I was churched and I wasn't saved. When I was 18 years old, I did get radically saved. 
And once that had happened for real in my life, I felt a conviction that I needed to get baptized. And so I went to a church, I actually went to the closest and fastest church I possibly could, and they ended up sprinkling me, and I hadn't like, you know, read the fine print beforehand. I didn't realize that's what they were going to do. So about two years later, I went to another church, and they said, hey, if you've been sprinkled, you haven't really been baptized. And so they took me to a hot tub and dunked me fully. The silly things that we do in the church, guys. I do believe in immersion. I think immersion is the clearest way because it preaches the parable that Jesus says um, uh, baptism should preach. But just because someone sprinkled you doesn't mean it didn't count. Don't get into that. Um, you read the ancient church fathers, especially the ones in the desert, and they've got lines. I mean, it's, it's amazing just how open their hearts are. But they're like, hey, if there's a lot of water, immerse somebody. If there's not very much water, sprinkle them. If there's no water where you're preaching, use sand. It's in, it's in the Dadachi, so go read it. It's there. Um, I was desperate to fully belong to Jesus. And I think that desperation is good. That desperation to follow his path and to be a Jesus follower, I think is good. Um, there's an old sci-fi movie. It's called Blade Runner. I'm not recommending that you watch it, but I'm just going to reference it. Harrison Ford is in it, if that helps. Um, but it's about androids. And, um, and these androids, um, because they were manufactured, um, they want them to appear human. They want them to think that they're human. So what they do, one of the things that they do is they, like, they, they give them a, a, a family photo or a photo of a memory from their past. And of course, they manufacture it because they're an android. They didn't grow up in a family. But that android holds on to it for dear life because it's the one thing that they have that makes them feel normal and makes them feel human, identifies them. And it's an interesting picture to me. This idea of what makes you who you are? What helps you to know who you are? Like, for instance, if somebody came up to you, you married people, and said, you're not married, prove it. Weird question, right? You're not married, prove it. How would you prove it? I get the ring right here. I remember the kiss. I remember the day. I've got the certificate. You want to see the certificate? I got the pictures. I got the people. Like, I could prove this in a court of law for sure. But what are, you, what are you doing there in that conversation? You're amassing all your signs, all your evidence, all your proof that the relationship is real. It's the same thing with your kids. Well, you don't have kids. Yes, I do. I was in the hospital room. I remember them crying. I remember like when, when they fell down and scraped the knee and we put the Band-Aid on with Superman on it, right? Like I remember all of that kind of stuff. I can walk around my house right now and I can point out all the different things that my kids have made there. Why? Because it's all the accumulation. It's the mementos. It's, it's the evidence that what we have is real. You're like, well, is that the stuff that makes it real? Follow me. That's not the stuff that makes it real but it does encourage us that it's real. So who's coming to you and saying that your relationship with Jesus isn't real? See, that's not silly. Amen. Because the enemy of our souls does come to you. And he does cause you to doubt. That's right. And he does make accusation against you. And he does say, yeah, 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 but you just sinned. And the reason you just sinned and the reason you just failed again, the way that you always fail is because you're not really a Christian. You're not really a Christian and you can't prove to me that you are. Where's your proof? Where's your proof of love? Where's your proof of belonging? I would say your proof, baptism is one of them. Following God Anytime you've followed God and talk to people who've gone down in the water and come back out again and what a moment that was, you know what it is. It's massive. It's a marker in their life. It is, it is the proof. It is the evidence 
I belong to God. That's why I did that. I've, I've, I've connected with him. I've, I've, I've identified with him. I'm with him. He's with me. Amen. Baptism is the gift that proves that I belong to him and that God himself belongs to me. That's weird language, isn't it? But God offers us that language that we would belong to him and that he himself would belong to us. There's a hymn that we sang in prayer meeting this morning. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. How dare you say, my Jesus, I know you're mine. The reason I dare is because God told me I can. That I am with Christ. There's a unity that has happened. And my baptism is a huge part of that. God is the king of the universe, but is he king of your heart? It's personal. No one else can do it for you. Romans 6, 3, and we won't have this on the screens, but um, if you're a note taker, look at Romans 6, 3 through 6. It even talks about baptism, maybe even having an ability to break the power of sin in your life or your slavery to sin in your life. Again, another massive supernatural mystery that God is doing during your baptism, that it would loosen the grip of sin. 1 John 2, 3, do you want to know for sure that you're a Christian? And by this we know that we have come to know God if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know God, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Do you see John saying it twice there? there? I can actually know that I belong to God. No matter what the devil says to me, no matter what my own doubts say to me, I can actually know assurance that I'm a Christian. By this I know whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. See, he's not saying that when you obey God, that that makes you good with God. What he's saying is when you walk as a Jesus follower, it encourages you, it assures you that you are a follower of Jesus. The most miserable kind of life to live in the entire world is to claim Christianity and then live for yourself. Because you're a broken person. It's hypocritical. There's no unity or integrity in your life. So John just comes and he just sees what we all feel. He's like, if you're claiming to be a follower of Jesus, then get following. Get following. And then when the, de- the, when the, when the doubts come, you get some ammunition to throw at the enemy, right? See, I know when I was baptized. I know when Jesus came and saved my soul. And when he wiped out my past and said, I was fully forgiven, I remember. And I remember the spiritual gifts that God gave to me. And I remember just like a, like a stumbling toddler taking my first steps of obedience down the road. How clumsy and how terrible I was at this Christian walk. But man, I was trying. And as I tried and God forgave me and God helped me, I just knew more and more I'm a child of God. I could give you countless examples. There was, a, there was a time a couple of months ago and I went to visit somebody who was in the ICU here at the local hospital. And I got out of the ICU. And I, was, I had been praying for this family and walked out of their room. And right when I was in the hallway, there was a woman down the hallway and said, pastor, you gotta help me, pastor. And she had started coming here. Man, her mom was in the, another one of the ICU rooms. And you got to pray with her. I don't know how long she's got. You got to pray with her. And we walked in together. And I prayed with this woman that I'd never known. And she was, she was less than a day away from the end of her life. And I get to preach her funeral. And I get to love on that family. But I got to tell you, as, as I'm walking down back to my car, and I'm like, Jesus, you're real. Like you, you, you organized things right at the right moment. And then you used me. And you used me in this powerful way. Why would you use me? 
I know my sin. I know what I've done. But you used me. And it's like, it's like Papa saying, you're my boy, right? Uh, Martin Luther. Some of you guys know Martin Luther. Powerful man of God. Started the Lutheran church. Started the Protestant Reformation. But if you read about him, he, he, he came under great attack from Satan. Great attack from the enemy. Wrote a lot about it. One of the things that he wrote on his desk in his bedroom in chalk, he said, was this phrase, baptizatus sum. That's Latin, and I don't know how to pronounce Latin. Baptizatus sum. It means I am baptized. And he wrote it on his desk. So whenever the enemy would come accusing him, whenever he was tempted towards sin, whenever he lost his peace or lost his joy, he would declare that back to the enemy. You don't know me. I'm a child of God. I've been saved by the risen Jesus. I walked away from my old life and I'm a baptized man. You can't say this to me because I know who I am. I am his and he is mine. Amen. Why don't you guys stand? The walk with Jesus, Eugene Peterson called it a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. Baptism is the first step. Let's pray. Jesus, God, for those who haven't taken this step yet, God, I pray that you would encourage them, God. Build them up. Give them, give them what they need to start walking in that. God, many of us have struggled with our assurance. We've struggled with knowing that we're saved, knowing that we belong to God and that he belongs to us. And Lord, I pray, that, God, that you would start to connect those dots. And, and Lord, I pray that you would call us to a, a new life, maybe, God, of, of following you more closely, Lord, and obeying your will, God, obeying your commands in our life, God, so that more and more of that would build up, more and more of that assurance would build up for us. Thank you, God, for salvation. God, we can't thank you enough, Lord, that you died on the cross, Lord, so that we could be clean, so our sin, our old life could be dead. What a miracle, Lord. Give us new life in Christ's name. Amen.